Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Marinus uh, with the uh, Vanderbilt Sports and Society Initiative. Um, we are so excited to have uh, what we're calling an all-star panel, uh, all-star symposium of leading scholars and authors and athletic administrators and professors and directors of institutes and Olympians, Pulitzer Prize winners joining us today. And we have uh, registrants from all over the country uh, for this symposium on sports and social action um, in partnership with the Vanderbilt Sports and Society Initiative and also the James Lawson Institute for the study of nonviolent movements uh, here at the Vanderbilt University Divinity School. And so to kick things off, we have the director of the James Lawson Institute, Dr. Phyllis Shepard. Good morning, everyone. And let me also offer my welcome. Um, glad that you're all here. Just a little bit about the James Lawson Institute. The James Lawson Institute was launched in July, 2021 in order to honor the legacy of Reverend James M. Lawson and his collaborators who were um, very instrumental in the nonviolent student movement, both here in Nashville, but across the country. Um, at the request of Reverend Martin Luther King, Reverend Lawson was asked to come to Nashville, pursue his theological education at Vanderbilt, and to train um, students in the strategies and practices of nonviolent movements. So when you hear about uh, the counter, sit-ins, that sort of thing, Reverend Lawson was one of the architects of that movement. Um, we honor his work through preparing the next generation that is in training and teaching about the philosophy and the strategies of nonviolence. We attend to the research that's being done and also um, seek to open panels uh, toward new research, particularly around the efficacy of nonviolence around social change. And uh, finally, we try to partner with others to create spaces to have the kind of conversations we need to have that will uh, affect social change. The Institute um, has several forums such as this that address not only, um, obviously not only sports, but also the ways in which young people today are engaged in practicing nonviolence in their pursuit of justice. And I will stop there and just say that um, one of the things that Reverend Lawson continues to say, he turned 95 in September, is that violence will never dismantle, never correct, never create systems of justice repair and reparation. And coupled with his understanding of nonviolence is a nonviolence that's grounded in deep love for all of humanity. Thank you. No, that's wonderful. And I am so excited to introduce our, our, our first speaker, who's someone I have a uh, deep love for, is uh, Candace Story Lee, who is our athletic director uh, here at Vanderbilt. Just an amazing person, an amazing leader, um, doing great things uh, here at Vanderbilt Athletics. She's the vice chancellor for athletics and university affairs and athletic director. She's the first woman, first black woman to be an athletic director in the history of the Southeastern Conference. Uh, Candace is what we call a triple door here at Vanderbilt with her undergraduate, master's, and doctorates, all from uh, Vanderbilt's Peabody School of Education. She came here as a student athlete, as a member of the women's basketball team, uh, became a, a team captain, be started her career in athletics as an intern in the athletic department, and has worked her way up all the way uh, to athletic director. And she is so supportive of this idea of the athletic department um, looking at issues around race and sports and politics and gender and sexuality and really being a part of this university, uh, not apart from the university. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Candace Story Lee. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you to all of our amazing panelists for being a part of this event today. And I also want to thank everybody that's tuning in. You know, there are many reasons that I'm thrilled that our Sports and Society Initiative is partnering with the James Lawson Institute to host today's symposium. First, any time that we have a chance to honor Reverend Lawson, we have to do it. I've had the opportunity to meet him and spend time around him on a handful of occasions on campus. 
And I can tell you that even into his 90s, there's an aura of wisdom, of peace, of truth, of courage that surrounds this gentleman. He is a true American hero and a legend of the civil rights movement. And our university is so fortunate to help carry on his legacy through the James Lawson Institute. Secondly, you don't often see partnerships between athletic departments and divinity schools. But today's event is a great example of what our chancellor, Daniel Deermeyer, calls radical collaboration. We like to think of it as our ethos, and it's what Vanderbilt is all about. Working together across disciplines and areas to bring something, to create something more impactful than we could do by ourselves. I must also say that this symposium is meaningful to me because I know how much it would mean to its two namesakes, Perry Wallace and David Williams. As most of you know, Perry Wallace became the first black basketball player in the SEC when he enrolled at Vanderbilt in the late 1960s. You know, I enrolled at Vanderbilt 30 years later also as a basketball player, and I know that that opportunity was made available to me because of his sacrifice. His experience here was not an easy one, but he often said that the trials of a pioneer were worthwhile if it served to educate other people if it made life easier for future generations, and if it improved the university and society as a whole. We've done a number of things at Vanderbilt to honor Perry Wallace symbolically, street names, residence hall names, portraits, a retired jersey, scholarships. But honestly, the most important way that we honor his legacy is by committing ourselves to being the kind of athletic department that leads and engages in meaningful discussions and truly makes a difference when it comes to sport and society. David Williams was a, a dear mentor to me, starting from my time as a student athlete and throughout the first 18 years of my career when I had the privilege of working for him and sort of sitting at his feet and just learning as much as I could. I like to say that Perry Wallace is the reason I came to Vanderbilt, but David Williams is the reason that I stayed. As he planned his retirement as vice chancellor and athletic director, he launched a sports and society initiative, and he looked forward to running it from his office at the law school. He tragically passed away just one week um, after retiring, but his spirit is alive and well here. We remain committed to his vision of bringing together leading scholars, authors, journalists, athletes, athletic administrators, and many, many more to study the ways in which sports and society interact and tear down the walls between campus and athletics. So with that as a backdrop, I thank you for joining us today. I think we're all looking forward to a series of amazing panels and I'll turn it back over to Andrew to introduce the panelists for our first discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank, I know this is a busy time in college sports. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to kick things off. Okay, so let's get it with it. Our first panel, uh, you've met Dr. Shepard, the director of the James Lawson Institute. Uh, she publishes widely on womanist perspectives on culture and lived religion, pastoral ethics, practical theology, gender, and sexuality, and the spiritual dimensions of activism. She's an author and a sought-after lecturer, social change consultant, and process facilitator. And it was her idea uh, to bring us together today uh, for this discussion. We are so grateful for that. Now, we also have uh, Lou Moore. Professor of History at Grand Valley State University in Michigan, where he teaches African-American history, civil rights, sports history, and U.S. history. Uh, his research and writing examines the interconnections between race and sports. You need to follow him on Twitter if you're interested in those uh, subjects. He's the author of I Fight for a Living, Boxing in the Battle for Black Manhood, 1880 to 1915, and We Will Win the Day, the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Athlete, and the Quest for Equality. I know he's working on a book on uh, Black quarterbacks right now. Uh, he's the co-host of the Black Athlete Podcast, which you need to listen to. His co-host of that podcast is Derek White, who's a professor of history in African-American and Africana studies at the University of Kentucky, joining us from Lexington today. Uh, Derek uses the lens of Black organizational life to examine modern Black history, sports history, and intellectual history. His most recent book, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, chronicles the development of Black college football in the 20th century is among the first comprehensive histories of Black college athletics. He's also, as I mentioned, the co-host of the Black Athlete Podcast. And both Lou and Derek are doing quite well in a fantasy football league that I'm familiar with, whose commissioner is our final panelist, uh, Brandon Bird, joining us here on campus at Vanderbilt, where he's Associate Professor of History in African-American and Diaspora Studies, uh, historian of Black intellectual and social history, 
with a special focus on the United States and Haiti. He's the co-editor of Modern Intellectual History and a co-editor of the Black Lives and Liberation series published by Vanderbilt University Press. And Brandon's a former D1 student athlete. He played tennis uh, at Davidson College. So thank you to all, all four of you for joining us for our first of, of three panels today. And as we get things started, trying to you know just set the, the context, set the stage here, Dr. Shepard, um, when you talk about the principles of nonviolent social action in, in affecting change, whether within sports or within other aspects of, of society, American culture, what are those principles and tenets of effective uh, social activism? Mm. You know, I, th I think um, a lot of us are familiar with the tenets where uh, the four points that Lawson makes where the first step is that we prepare ourselves. A lot of times people think that means that we just show up and say that we're willing to do this. But for him, preparation meant that you prepared yourself by doing the right research so you knew what you were talking about. You prepared your, when I say yourself, I mean the group. I, he wasn't speaking to individuals in that way. Um, you prepared yourself in being knowledgeable about what the um, complex issues were affecting the change that you wanted. And you prepared yourself as a group, um, he would say, by being spiritually grounded in your commitment to nonviolence. Next, he, he would talk about um, talk, talk about the importance of negotiation. So for instance, here in Nashville, when it wasn't a secret what they were going to do when they um, sat at the countertops, you negotiate and say you want change. And of course the change doesn't come. So those kind of conversations. And that's also partly to say that um, folks who are involved in nonviolent direct action are always willing to be at the table if it's a genuine effort about bringing about change. The third, of course, is direct action. And that can, there are all kinds of direct action. We mostly think of things like protests and we think of, you know, sitting at the countertop, but there are a variety of actions that are non-direct. Obviously writing letters is one, showing up is another, um, boycotting, effective boycotts, are another, so showing up and then following up. So here at the Lawson Institute, if whenever there are students who are involved in any kind of engagement, there's pre-training, but there's also follow-up. And that's so crucial to talk about um, not only what did we do, how were we on, on the spot, particularly when something challenging happened and how do we mediate against that? But, a final piece I would add, and I said it when I first spoke, and that is um, Reverend Lawson always talks about the importance of love and that the love that is changing, the love that is um, responsive to human suffering. In other words, it, it cannot be um, our nonviolent direct actions cannot be grounded in the same kinds of hatreds, the same kinds of um, dehumanizing feelings that lead us to need nonviolent direct action. In a nutshell, that's what I'm saying. Thank you. To the, uh, let's start with uh, Derek. You know, when I think about uh, athletes uh, who have been involved in, um, you know, pushing for social change in this country, I think about Dr. Harry Edwards, you know, who has talked about the different stages that we have seen over the course of history and that, you know, there's been an evolution or, you know, times change and athletes have different platforms or different ways of affecting change. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a primer uh, on that, that notion of these different waves of, of Black athlete activism and where are we today? First of all, let me uh, thank the folks at, at Vanderbilt for another invitation. It is always an honor and pleasure to to work with my colleagues uh, uh, just down the road now. Uh, and Andrew and Brandon and Phyllis, is, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And Lou, I, I talk to Lou all the time. Uh, um, so yeah, I, let me just say, I think that part of the challenge is when we talk about this long history of, of athletic, Black athletic activism, it is also rooted in 
uh, the the historical context, right? That some in some cases, when we're talking about the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, sometimes just being present is a challenge to the was a challenge to the racial order, right? We're thinking about here in the state of Kentucky, uh, we've done a, I think a, an an excellent job in celebrating the kind of um, uh, the tremendous legacy of black jockeys like Isaac Murphy and others whose participation uh, in uh, the Kentucky Derby and a host of other kind of stakes races all across the country speaks to this kind of larger legacy about how could African-Americans um, by their pr presence and their success challenge the very notions of racial inferiority that uh, permeated U.S. society throughout the early uh, late 19th and early 20th century. And by the time we think of of, of the post war of the World War II period, we see that now just presence alone is not just enough. How are you going to to challenge uh, not only uh, with your presence, but the kind of structures about that are functioning? So we think of someone like Joe Lewis, who um, who was able to win the heavyweight title, not to still lose thunder as our boxing expert here, uh, but to, to think a little bit about his, his role. But I always talk a little bit, not just about his role as joining the U.S. military and supporting the war effort and trying to raise Black morale and challenging segregation on camps across in the United States and in Europe, but I think about his support of someone like Isaac Woodward, who came home uh, as a veteran and was um, tragically attacked uh, in a, an attack in South Carolina. And it was Joe Lewis who was by his side as he saw trying to justice for this kind of event. Uh, and then when we move into the civil rights era, uh, we see athletes uh, like Wilma Rudolph, Tennessee's own Wilma Rudolph and others using their kind of success and platform to really call for uh, kind of nonviolent change in many ways. Uh, and when we get to this present moment, I think this present moment is, is fraught with a lot of, of tension and a lot of opportunity in many ways, because we are at a moment in which, um, you know, athletes have been have reached the ultimate heights of success, right? Both both personal success and financial success. But how does that translate into uh, societal success and societal change? And I think that's a question that we saw in 2020 with the, the 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 national and international protests around George Floyd on college campuses, but in towns and cities across America. But also the question of what, you know, where do we go from here? As King asked uh, in 1967, 1968, how do we move forward and how can athletes be, I think, an instrument of change, right? Because they do have these tremendous platforms, both at the collegiate level as well as the professional level. And so I'll, uh, you know, I'll cede some of the time to my my distinguished colleagues here. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. We've got we've got plenty of time. Uh, Lou, we'll come to you. You've written about, uh, you know, athletes over course of history boxers you know going back to the 1800s uh black athletes during the civil rights movement i know you're keenly aware of what's happening today what are the main changes you've seen or that you talk about with your students in the way that athletes have um, expressed their opinions and, and been activists yeah um like derek said i like first before i start speaking just thank you guys for for having me on, on this panel even to you brandon who stole dak prescott from somebody in our fantasy football league uh but but i said the main change when i talk to my students when we do um athlete activists or you know from the civil rights movement and out number one i think the biggest change is black women being involved i know um Derek you know Mrs. Wilma Rudolph but you know there's not a lot at that time right um in the 1960s we're talking about Thea Wilma Rudolph um and and just a few others because they're not being asked to be involved right and there's just there's just no title nine at that time right so you do have a lot of black women playing college sports but it's just not as robust as we have now but now I mean as we talked about in, in the book right there we went today in a new four and it's it's you know WNBA and that vote Warnock campaign as I told my students last week or two weeks ago that really had the ability to really change you know the course of United States history right by, by being able to get Warnock in there and and changing how the Senate looked in the United States or if you go to the the Minnesota Lynx and their Black Lives Matter protests before Colin Kaepernick right uh to protest uh Philando Castillo in, in St. Paul and so Black women whether we're talking about them or we're talking about uh, her name escapes me the shot putter or some old miles talking about uh mental health are really at the forefront now where they weren't allowed i think the other part too now is just the way um, businesses are are trying to get involved and i think you'll see that start to creep up post 2012 when when you know the miami heat wear that hoodie um wear the hoodies and they don't get 
in trouble. Like these black athletes don't get in trouble, right? And so all this stuff where where MJ, oh Gwen Berry, so thank you, America. Gwen Berry, uh, all this stuff where where MJ um was, you know, staying silent, whether he said Republicans wear sneakers or not. A lot of athletes follow that model. But once LeBron, D. Wade, Chris Bosch, and those guys, there's no pushback from that. You see them getting involved and able to use um, their platforms and also their businesses in, in a way to to kind of have some change, right? Whether, you know, whether it's Nike getting involved with Serena or Cap or, or whatever. And we're almost in this stage where it's hard to call it, but might be the wrong word for it, but you know, conscious capitalism, where these black athletes are trying to use the business platform to make change and also get involved in business to make change. And and so someone like LeBron, um, you know, buying um, into businesses and ownership, I think he sees that as a way to make change, just as Magic uh, did. Um, so that I think that's where we're at. And I will push my time to, to somebody else. There's so many uh, topics you brought up there that I want to follow up on. But Brandon, I'll come to you. I know that you look at uh, sports often from an international uh, point of view. Um, when you look at activism by Black athletes internationally, what are uh, some stories that come to mind and how has that um, you know, tracked with the ways that athletes have expressed themselves here in the United States? How has it been different? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, you know, first I'll start off uh, again, reiterate everybody's thanks uh, you know, for the invitation to be here to be in conversation, uh, you know, with all these good folks, Lou, Derek, uh, you know, folks that I really admire, uh, that I would certainly uh, enjoy our heated battles on the fantasy, uh, uh, the fantasy battlefield, but I uh, enjoyed being in these spaces with them for sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm primarily a scholar of uh, Black internationalism, Pan-Africanism, uh, you know, that's, uh, those uh, those politics and thought. Uh, so I, I tend to approach when uh, I should say I, I uh, feel in part as an interloper. Uh, you know this conversation. You know Derek and Lou. Like these are the real the real experts. You know on this subject. You know so I, I come at it with less expertise and from this particular angle. So I say that uh, you know just as a uh, in admission. You know. Um, but yeah, and so, you know, approaching it from the angle of Pan-Africanism, Black internationalism as a scholar of Haiti as well, too, uh, you know, it does, uh, you, know, it, you know, you see some things there. Um, you know, you see some connections between the domestic and the international and the ways uh, that people of African descent have tried to uh, uh, bridge those things or identify the links, uh, right? Uh, and that holds especially true for a space like the Olympics, right? Uh, you know, where just fundamentally, you know, due to that uh, that model of, of competition, um, you know, where are those lines between domestic and international uh, blur? And uh, uh, where you see, uh, you know, the, uh, the necessity uh, oftentimes to uh, bring, um, you know, what may ostensibly be national concerns uh, you know, into an international arena or to uh, uh, bring international concerns to bear on the domestic arena, right? So that's all very abstract, but, you know, to try to make that a little more concrete, uh, uh, one figure that, uh, I, you know, I've done some work on is uh, actually a Haitian athlete, uh, Silvio, Silvio Cator, uh, who may, may be unfamiliar to a lot of folks here, but uh, in his day was uh, extremely famous. Um, He's a turn of the 20th century athlete. He's born in 1900. Uh, he participates in the 1924, 28, and 32 Olympics. And uh, for those that know a little bit about uh, Haitian history, uh, that's a particularly important time period because that's an era in which Haiti, when Haiti is under occupation by the United States, 24, 28, 32. Um, so he is, to you know, say that bluntly, when he participates in the Olympics, he is doing so as the representative of an occupied nation, as a nation that, uh, you know, it does not have independence, has no sovereignty, right? Um, so his very participation has a political bent to it, right? When he walks in 24, uh, that Olympics held in Paris, when he walks into the uh, Olympic arena carrying the Haitian flag, uh, along with his other compatriots, uh, it's not only the flag of an occupied nation under its former colonizer, 
uh, right? Uh, he's doing so, uh, you know, as one of the most uh, accomplished athletes of his day. Uh, he didn't uh, achieve what he wanted to at that Olympics, but the next one, he gains a silver medal, uh, the last Haitian medal at Olympics. Uh, shortly after that Olympics, he goes on to win, uh, to achieve the world record in the long jump. Uh, you know, so, you know, just by his very nature, like, you know, he's embodying, uh, you know, Haitian independence in many ways. Uh, but he also is, uh, he's very much a, um, uh, a nationalist in an era of uh, anti-colonial Haitian nationalism. Uh, when he returns to Haiti after the 28 Olympics, uh, he uh, leads a petition campaign, uh, you know, to try to... Um, uh, you know, present the grievances of Haitians with the U.S. occupation. It's a very violent occupation. Uh, he then goes on to uh, eventually hold a uh, position in the initial post-occupation Haitian governments uh, due to that anti-occupation uh, role he had previously. Uh, and so, you know, th this is a model of uh, athlete activism that, again, may not be our familiar one, right? Even in his own era, he's a contemporary of Jesse Owens. Uh, when we think of uh, these ties between domestic and foreign, uh, the ways that athletes use that international space, you know, we may think of, you know, you know, like Tommy Smith, uh, you know, later. Um, uh, we think of folks like, uh, you know, Bill Russell, uh, you know, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, uh, but he's very much, you know, in that same mode. Um, you know, so to your point, Andrew, uh, you know, this uh, world of global politics, global sports, uh, you know, I think it uh, in many ways mirrors, uh, you know, the, you know, the examples that Lou and, and Derek pointed out of, you know, of athletes who will, uh, you know, stump for Black Lives Matter. Um, in many ways, it's the same folks, uh, uh, the same impulse driving it. Um, uh you know, it, it is of the, the same, the same variant, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shepard, um, wanted to ask you as a theologian and someone that studies uh, nonviolent social action, what, what is the, the moral responsibility of just a, a human being to, um, to say something, you know, in the face of injustice? Uh, does, does everyone have that responsibility? I think you mentioned the first tenant was knowledge and research, uh, which implies maybe not everyone does have that responsibility, or did you have the, does everyone have that responsibility to do the research? Um, you know, I'll ask our other panelists about what we expect of athletes, but just, you know, from a human perspective, what, what, what do uh, Reverend Lawson and others like him yourself have to say about that responsibility that we all have? Wow. Uh, that might be a theological anthropology question, but what I would say is that Yes, we all have the responsibility to notice violence, to notice suffering, to to be able to um, to know that a country is occupied, to know that powers, those that have power, abuse it for their own benefit, particularly their own um, economic benefit. Um, so I think we all have the responsibility, and and in terms of research. Um, I don't think that's a privileged positionality. Um, we should be aware by listening to various uh, news sources, but uh, but particularly listening to what people who are uh, under the heel of violence and um, oppressive regimes are saying. So I uh, guess I I think that we have that responsibility. We have the responsibility. You know, one of the things I always say in my class, I think most of us do, and that's follow the money who's losing it, who's getting it, um, how it's being used, what's valued. Um, yeah, I think um, by being human, we are um, we are called to grapple with, wrestle with the moral and ethical questions of the day. And I think whatever context we're in, we are, we are required um, to ask those questions and to uh, listen to the various responses we get back. But this is not a, um, a specialized group. And when I think of um, nonviolent direct action, um, there are certain dimensions of the practice that are happening that, that can be used for people's benefit, not thinking of others. I think 
the, the goal of education, I, I even want to say the goal of sports is to bring people, to call people into greater collaboration, greater awareness, and greater commitment to the caring of, of the world. And when we get to the point where we don't have to notice or we, or we choose not to notice because there are repercussions that we don't want to be subject to, we lose the soul of of countries. Um, we lose the soul of who it is we are as people. So yeah, I think we're all called to it. And I think we should hold one another accountable to that. And Derek, uh, come to you. I mean, there's been examples of athletes over the years who have said, you know, I'm not a role model. I'm, I'm just a power forward. You know, uh, others who yeah. say that comes with the territory, you know, with this platform that I have uh, and the opportunity with that platform to affect change. How has has that notion of the responsibility of an athlete changed over the years? How do you assess it today? And is it uh, a fair expectation that we look to our athletes uh, to provide leadership on these important issues? Um, I don't know if it's a fair question, right? I think that athletes are put in a position because they are probably the the, the most high profile, at least until Barack Obama, uh, black employees uh, in, in America, right? That they are folks that everyone can, many folks can identify uh, by name, by face in a way that us as professors uh, can go, uh, uh, you know, uh, can go invisible in the world and and in a way. And so when LeBron talks or uh, when Simone Biles talks about mental health, it generates a, a generates a different kind of response in a way than than us, any of us talking about these very same issues. And so, you know, they are also tasked with being very, you know, experts in their field of athletics, right? And so there is a, you know, it's a double, it's a double-edged sword. But this is part of the legacy, right? That one of the things that we that that I think comes through in many of our courses on sports is that you know that that the black athlete uh, has a responsibility, right? This is this is our our friend and colleague Howard Bryant's point in the heritage, right? That they are uh, being asked whether they want to or not that they are being put into this lineage that dates back to the early 20th century that is exemplified by Paul Robeson and Jackie Robinson and carried forward by athletes of every kind of generation uh, and every generation. And so it has ebbed and flowed, right? And so that I think, Lou, you brought up this point earlier in which uh, someone like Michael Jordan made a decision to, to embrace a kind of um, non-socially conscious uh, persona in order to, you know, in order to maximize his greatness, at both economically and uh, in his own field. And that is a very different kind of uh, trajectory that uh, we've seen. And so I think that athletes are often tasked with or facing with this kind of con conundrum, right? Is there, a, you know, do we come out and use this platform? Or if we, um, you know, we can behind the scenes and write a check, which can be very influential in maintaining uh, the support and the financial support that many of these uh, many organizations need. But it lose they also refuse to give the kind of uh, attention that these organizations and issues require. Uh, and, you know, and I think it's also the other part. And I think this is where uh, Professor Shepard, I think it hits us on the head when you talk about research. We're also asking these athletes <laughs> to <laughs> to research, right, to be to not just talk off the top of their head, head, but to also prepare themselves. Right. And that's a it is a large task. Like I'm not I'm, I don't want us to to minimize the um, the level of expectation for. Uh, what we're asking of athletes. And I think events like this, let me just just talk about how great this is in terms of uh, that the the relationship between an athletic department and the James Lawson Center to put together a panel is a way in which uh, at the collegiate, we know uh, that student athlete is a term that the NCAA created, but it is also an opportunity for us to embrace the student side of that equation, right? And that encourage that our athletes not just be sequestered off in these multi-million dollar locker rooms, um, but they also get the kind of education that can prepare them for the time, for the potential moment that when these ideas and moments occur, that they have done prepared themselves and they at least know have a array of folks that they can call on for gain for, for greater insight when they try to make these kind of important decisions. I think that's an important part of that equation as well. 
And so I think that, you know, going forward, what we really are looking forward, you know, looking looking to as scholars is really looking towards athletes to to continue to to grow uh, their understanding of, of complex social issues, uh, but also having the courage to continue to, to to go out and support these issues as we've seen over the last, I want to say, decade and a half here in the United States, as well as globally. Lou, how do you look at this issue in terms of the uh, the responsibility, the opportunity uh, an athlete has with, you know, increasingly large platforms? You mentioned earlier, you know, the the endorsements and these athletes, their their job is not just really on the field anymore, but there's a potential um, they're representing a company. Oftentimes, I feel like in the case of Colin Kaepernick, his activism may have, you know, cost him his NFL a career, but he still remains, um, you know, a a spokesperson for Nike. Um, how what, how does that calculus work these days in terms of, um, you know, the how an athlete might look at this uh, responsibility or this opportunity that they have? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think it's changed like within the last couple of years, right? And so if we go back to say, like if we go to the 70s, right, where you see really a, a lessening of athlete involvement, right? This kind of post OJ, and then we get into Dr. J and MJ, you know, always getting these endorsements. Um, you know, there's this idea that these athletes were now kind of looking at the the companies and not their communities, right? When it comes to endorsements and and money and money talks, um, and I think that athletes nowadays have a real opportunity to shape what their companies are going to do, right? If they support them, and I and you know to get these big kind of global tech companies involved in these movements, whether it's just something simple as, you know, voting rights and making, you know, more than a vote or more than an athlete and all that stuff, getting involved in that. Um, 2020, I think you saw the real growth of that, um, you know, companies getting involved. And I don't know if it was like a combination of George Floyd, COVID, and everyone thought they had to be involved. But now I think there's going to be, a little bit, you know, uh, back in the way of companies. I, I think a lot of companies now are, are scared uh, to to get involved because of the pushback. Um, this kind of post George Floyd pushback that they received, and athletes now have to navigate again, once again this terrain. How how do I get involved? How do I use my position? And and let me be clear, like I'm not in their position, right? So so this is not. I don't have you know 50 million on the line. I don't have generation wealth on the line. So it's easy for me to say, yeah, you should always get involved. But you should always get involved, right? Um, because as Derek pointed out a couple minutes ago, it's just what it is. You are the most visible uh, Black American that we have, right? For you know for for whatever reason that is and and you do have a responsibility and and it's like it goes back to that mlk i know mlk might be, be brought up again but it's that jackie robinson saying right he was the he was our sit-inner before the sit-ins he was our freedom writer before freedom rights right he's because of his because he's an athlete because he's famous he was that visual visual representation of all of us not just as an athlete but what integration would look like what activism would look like and i think these athletes have to carry that on um no matter what the punishment is and and i think because they do have a lot of them do actually have generational wealth they can take more risk nowadays that where other guys in the 60s couldn't take a risk right where where if you raise your hand at the olympics you're you're done right like tommy smith and john carlos although they were amateur athletes at that time suffered tremendously after that for for quite some time because of the risk that they took uh and i don't think you know athletes now face professional athletes i don't think they face that type of backlash so they do have a responsibility but also as derek says that they, they do have to read up on, on on these things right uh but read up with intention it can't just be say hey, i have to read up on this and i don't want to answer it um a great example of this is this is not to bash lebron because i think he's done tremendous things uh, for for his community, right, uh, with his school and other, and and then more than a vote. But you know, when T Tamir Rice is is let's call it, you know, murdered by the police, and he's asked about this, he says, "I have to read up on this," right. And and one of the things I I recall is reading the Craig Hodges book, and he was talking about Rodney King, like you know, well that's almost like twenty years prior to that, but he's talking about Rodney King, and MJ. That's that's a uh, Michael Jordan um and you know Michael's not answering anything and Craig Hodges is famous saying I think he says this on the Showtime documentary is seeing is knowing and sometimes you actually don't have to read up on these things you just have to be present and and be paying attention to actually have 
um, something to say, something positive to say that that moves the needle in one way, but also gets people to understand. We're in such a generation now where young kids um, follow these athletes, what they say, what they do. And sometimes it's got to be more than just a, a cool dance that they do on a sideline. It's got to be more than this when they hit a three. It, it You can change how these young kids think about society and social issues. And Brandon, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, you played tennis at, at Davidson. You're, you're a D1 athlete with a bit of a platform. You weren't Steph Curry playing basketball at Davidson. You know, um, your role wasn't as indispensable as his. You know, so when you saw things happening in the world um, as a student athlete, like, did you feel comfortable to speak up? Um, and in your role as a professor now dealing with uh, Vanderbilt student athletes or observing them on campus, other uh, college athletes, what do you sense is the comfort level uh, with becoming involved uh, at the college level today? Uh, yes, yeah, a good question. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah, far, far from Steph Curry. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I don't know, everybody has to come into their own. Uh, you know, I can say, speaking for myself, I was sort of, uh, I was head down, uh, head down in the books, uh, you know, to, you know, to be frank, uh, you know, I was trying to, you know, put in the work, especially by, you know, the, the tail end of college, I was in a you know, honors program that, oh, that, that, you know, that, that ran me ragged, uh, you know, to be honest, you know, had me thinking about the, the plans for grad school, uh, you know, so honestly, I, I was in the weeds a little bit, so I, I wasn't necessarily out there, uh, uh, you know, in the streets. So I, I understand people, you know, you, 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 come, to, you come to your own, uh, you know, you reach a level of consciousness at, uh, at different phases, right? So, you know, so for me, the, the work was, uh, you know, I'm a student of Black history, and, and this is what I, what I need to get down uh, to get where, where I want to go. Um, you know, but to... Uh, to the broader question about, you know, how I see, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, student athletes in the past. And I should say too, like, we got to put uh, uh, D white on the spot here too. Uh, University of Maryland, Turk soccer. Uh, so you may, we get to him, get his response too. Um, you know, so where I see, you know, student athletes, you know, fitting in, uh, you know, perhaps their role and struggle, um, you know, Vanderbilt and beyond. Um, you know, I tend to give a lot of uh, a lot of leeway, uh, understanding that uh, you know while you know certainly I think there's more visibility and fame for student athletes now than and this is a dangerous thing to say as a historian you say that perhaps ever but um, I, I think maybe that's true I uh, that there is a different uh, level of attention on college sports. Uh, you know, today for a number of reasons, right? Uh, whether it be television contracts that make sure that, uh, especially if you're at a, uh, you know, power five and also at a, uh, you know, a, a blue blood at a power five that, you know, you're going to be broadcast. Um, no, uh, you know, the attention on transfer portal, all these things have, have limited uh, a level of, uh, of visibility. Um, you know, so even while that's true in that Lisa, uh, you know, conversations about platform, what you do with it, you know, ultimately the, the youngest, they're 18 years old, right? Um, and there is, uh, you know, a, a level of, uh, you know, education, uh, you know, that's going on and they're, they're coming to understand themselves and their place in the world. Um, you know, so I tend to leave a, a lot of, uh, you know, you know, give, give some leeway there and some, some understanding and sympathy. Uh, with that said, though, I think that uh, on the flip side, that leads to uh, for those student athletes that uh, do gain some level of consciousness and do feel comfortable uh, with taking a, a stance on whether it be labor issues or, you know, issues related to race or, uh, you know, sexism and all these things are, are related. I don't mean to, you know, disaggregate them. They're all related. For those that do take a stand uh, and join that heritage, right? Um, you know, I, I think that deserves a, uh, you know, massive uh, congratulations and support, right? Um, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, whether that be the, the student athletes that, that are, you know, trying to unionize, you know, the, the, those at, uh, you know, Northwestern, uh, our student athletes here, uh, you know, particularly I'm thinking of the women's basketball team uh, that uh, decided to, uh, you know, join uh, their peers elsewhere and, uh, you know, they, you know, take a knee, uh, you know, during the, the national anthem, uh, you know, as a sign of their solidarity with uh, racial justice uh, protest movements, uh, you know, who had reached that level of consciousness. I should say that they, they took some flack from that, a large amount of flack. Um, you know, so that deserves our support, right? Uh, you know, those that that stand up even at an early stage of, you know, their um, athletic careers and in consciousness and education that say, you know, I'm there and I'm ready. Um, uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for that, all that's to say. And, uh, you know, I'm adamant that they they then deserve our support, uh, you know, our support. Mm -hmm. Man, this this conversation is going fast. We've got about ten minutes left, uh, Doctor Shepard. I wanted to ask you, um, through your own study of the civil rights movement, uh, through your own work, what is the proper role of of allies? You know, um, I know mm -hmm. that uh, there have been figures mm -hmm. that have uh, welcomed participation, say, of 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 white people in the civil rights movement. Others, you know, say that's you know this is not your your place uh women's rights movement the same for men um what, what what have you come to decide about the proper role the proper place of of allies in these social uh, movements for social change in some i would say it's everybody's responsibility uh i agree with the category allies but partly what that does is it says for instance racism is my issue and i'm joining you in it no racism is a collective issue. So to that degree, I say everybody needs to sign on the dotted line and get into the struggle and engage it um, full heartedly. The term I think allies is useful sometimes because it gives us a way to point out that the closer you are to the suffering and the injustice that you're talking about, the more the less chance or opportunity you have, I put that in quotation marks, to back off from it. So one of the complaints with allies is that, you know, I'm in when it's okay to be in. And when the flag starts, I want to change the discourse. I want to change the focus. And I, I think it, I think commitment and staying in for the long haul is something that one works toward, maybe committed to, but works toward. So yes, we need everyone in it. And if your category is ally today, to me, that's that's a step on the movement to it actually being, you are in it because it is about you. Racism, sexism, homophobia, that is about us as humanity. So we're only an ally because we haven't quite fully accepted that we are, a, that this is about us too. Derek, I think when I think about this in sports, you know, you'll often say in the wake of a, of a police killing, you'll have um, maybe a black commentator say, why aren't the white players on this team being asked about this issue also, you know, or, or other issues? Um, what have you seen in this regard? And, you know, how do you talk about this this issue uh, with your students? Have there been examples of, of allies who have who have stayed with an issue in history um, or current athletes that that you uh, particularly admire for the way that they've stepped up for um, you know an, another group of people um I think this is a question of commitment right I think that one of the most broadly and I think this is where dr Shepard is leaning in is that ally feels like a, a is an entry point and not an end point and I think that part of what we would like to see from from everywhere and that you know as we work on, on college campuses one of the things that I, I talk a lot about in my class is um the way in which you know uh student that that the movement around george floyd and brianna taylor here in the state of kentucky um a, a, you know galvanized students of all colors about what they saw as uh, a measure of injustice uh, and that that movement drug and carry forward both student athletes and coaches, right? And I think that one of the things that strikes me is that, um, you know, 
that allyship is funny, right? Like it's like, you know, these coaches are out here walking and marching in behalf of this. But when it comes time to hire a new assistant coach, there are no black candidates in the pool, right? Like these are, this is, you know, so, so does racial justice just end at the end of the march, right? How does one ally? And so how do we, as you know, this is where at the collegiate level, especially, this is where there's such a disconnect in too many institutions between the athletic department and what happens on the main part of campus, right? Um, in the sense that we, that these campuses are often filled with scholars such as ourselves, as well as those on the panel that will be coming after us, uh, of, of, of brilliant scholars who thought about these questions uh, deeply and 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 for a continual amount of time that they can provide a can be a resource right and in the way that coaches rely on strength coaches right the coaches don't know what the workout should be but why are they not ever um you know developing and further developing um the the kind of uh, the cultural and social issues around the day of the day by relying on the faculty and this is the kind of issues that we see that I've seen throughout my career at a lot of different institutions, not everywhere is Vanderbilt, right? Is taking this kind of approach. And I think that's an important part. And so how do we build allyship? Like, how do we turn this into commitment? It requires that these can't be just one moment, right? That this becomes part and parcel of a, an entire process of thinking about how an institution, how a coach, how a, uh, a program, how, how that, can move forward as a time, right? And so to me, I think that, you know, when we can identify individuals, I think that gives us the wrong impression, right? I think the, the, that by focusing on individuals and not the structures, we want to have structures in place that allow for us to create commitment about these very complicated and complex and uh, issues, R racism, homophobia, sexuality, as, as Brandon said, we're not disaggregate. All these things are intertwined. And if we're not trying to grapple that at, at, at university, right, then we really need to have a conversation about what sport is at, <laughs> at, at the, at this level, right, that, you know, uh, Brandon does international. In Europe, this is not a problem because the universities don't have multi-billion dollar sports programs attached to them, right, that they have that they are putting their resources into developing uh, young soccer players that can be in their team or sold something like that is a very capitalistic, very intentional program. But if we're going to have universities tied to it, then there seems to be, at least in my opinion, um, a, a kind of responsibility to develop all our athletes, right? That they can have complex discussions that, about issues of the day, that it can't just be X's and O's and trapping them in locker rooms, that they need to be thinking about this. Is, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity for us as a society because as Lou and others on this panel have pointed out, that these athletes are going to go, not all of them, but they're going to be in workplaces. They're going to be leaders in, in you know, we talk about this all the time. They're going to be leaders in industry. They're going to be leaders in business. They're going to be professional athletes. They can take that knowledge and that experience that Brandon and myself gained as Division One athletes back in the day and use them in a different place. And that's where we really should be training them in these issues because they already work in collaboration. No team sports function individually, right? Like they all are about collaboration. So there's a, a mechanism already in place that I don't think we as a higher ed in particular are using. And that creates a vacuum so that when they get to the professional level, they don't often have the infrastructure, the knowledge, or the, even the understanding to try to approach these things. And so it's much easier to take the $50 million uh, uh, endorsement deal and not say nothing. Mm. We've got about uh, a minute here, Lou, I'm going to come to you. Um, <laughs> Picking up on something Derek mentioned, you know, at its best, I think, you know, you'll hear people say that sports has the opportunity to bring people together from different walks of life better than in many other institutions in our society. You know, whether as teammates and I, someone I admire, Bill Curry, he said that when he got to the Green Bay Packers, he realized that everybody's sweat smells the same, you know, and that that had a profound impact on him. Um or as fans, I mean, is that just sort of a, a Pollyanna-ish uh, attitude to have? Have, have we actually seen that? by being teammates or by cheering on someone who's different from you, that does that add up to something? I know you're coaching some fifth and sixth grade basketball players right now. Like, do you see that either as a historian or just in your own lived experience? I mean, have you seen, is this a benefit of, of sports? 
Yeah, you know, I think it can be and it should be. And and, and I, I think the problem is sometimes we sell it too much. Like it's that Pee Wee Reese, Jackie Robinson, one day we'll all wear 42, right? And and, and not really realizing that the H-E double hockey sticks Jackie had to go through. Um, but but I think it's it's the problem is, is that sports has this ability to bring us together until that black athlete drops the touchdown or he throws the intercession. And then what it does, it reveals who we are, right? And And, and I think just living in this kind of post Kaepernick moment. I think that's the greatest example. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks love Kaepernick um, up until 2016. And then once he started Neil, they love the NFL and see how many people I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not watching this anymore. Go, go, woke, go broke mentality uh, that, that a lot of people have. Um, so I, you know, I think I just, the reality is because racist fandom is just part of who we are in, in American society uh, from the beginning of sports. I don't know if it truly brings people together just because of how um, deep people feel about race. But the other reality, and I'll, and I'll stop too, is just sometimes our problem is with, with sports is that we spend a lot, a lot, a lot of public money on building these private complex. I'm sure you guys in Nashville know this as the Titans who don't need a new stadium are going to get a new stadium and then we're not thinking about where does that half a billion dollar goes and, and who does it really truly impact uh, when we spend money on that 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 team who are only going to have eight to nine games, uh, especially if they don't start Malik Willis, right? They're only going to have eight to nine games a year. Where is that money going? Where can it uh, be better served? And I think that really has an impact on the community. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I just sort of realized over the course of looking at this Zoom that everybody but Phyllis shares the same barber. So uh, we need to uh, acknowledge that <laughs> before we go. Um, but uh, Dr. Shepard, uh, Lou Moore, Brandon Bird, Derek White, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to get this uh, online symposium off to a great start. Uh, really appreciate your time and uh, best of luck to you and, and uh, happy holidays. Thank you.